Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having an unbelievable week. I hope that uh, whatever your plans are, whatever you're striving for, I really do truly hope that uh, you are making progress to that. Uh, today we are going to continue our series on... Um, multi-generational transmission of trauma and its impact on the black community over the last 155 plus years. Uh, I am going to challenge you at the beginning of this to support the work we do in the community. And some people may ask, well, why should we support you? Well, we're dealing with a situation where they have over 1,300 think tanks that are highly funded, I mean billion dollar type funded. Uh, these think tanks address everything from generational wealth uh, to academics, to um, social structures, education, uh, politics, and, and on incremental levels in each little micro sub subsector of each of these topics. There's a think tank uh, designed to ensure that those in power stay in power. Those who are benefit and, and experiencing advantages and privileges keep those, and those who aren't are uh, kept at bay. And we have roughly two think tanks underfunded. Uh, we have uh, very few uh, research centers. The Odyssey Project is one. Uh, specifically dedicated to researching and understanding the enigmatic issues that plague the black community in every front. Uh, we need that support. We also are highly uh, active in program creation in design and development as well as program implementation on a national level. We also are accessible uh, with programs that deal with mental health, domestic violence, um, childhood sexual abuse and adverse adverse childhood experiences matter of fact I just did a um, uh, workshop on adverse childhood experiences uh, with the Harris County Sheriff's Office um, I don't know if you can see this thing but dealing with, and this is what we're talking about today as a matter of fact so I guess I'll just leave this out epigenetics which is one of the major influences on the perpetuation of childhood uh, and uh, adult perpetuation of trauma uh, on a multi-generational uh, level. Uh, I've spent years and years of research in that area um, and I am challenging everyone to support the work we're doing because you don't you don't guess, protest, wish, your way out of situations like this. You gain an understanding of the strategies of the situations, of the events, uh, of the influences on your situation, and you learn how to counter them. There's so much. When I wrote The Undoing of the African American Mind, which was my 23rd book, it was a dissertation, so to speak, on a lot of what I'm going to talk about over the next few weeks in these different series. But we have so much work to do, and we have this casual mindset that we pass off. Uh, we just expect someone else to do it. We just expect because uh, we believe we're right that somehow it will auto-correct and that we don't have to play a role in uh, the correction of the wrongs that have been perpetuated against us, our ancestors, and will continue with our progeny as long as we don't engage in some level of anti-oppression. Uh, and that comes first and foremost with education, uh, not simply the acquisition of academic skills, but the influential, influential uh, introduction into self. We don't know who we are, and because we don't know who we are, we are constantly being misled and misguided. There is a saying uh, that says that if I know you better than you know me, I can influence you. 
But if I know you better than you know yourself, I can control you. And that is exactly what we're dealing with here, is we're dealing with a system that studies us more than we study ourselves. We're dealing with a system that takes time to understand what triggers us, what moves us, what keeps us at bay, what easily distracts us, what are our weaknesses, how to play with our emotions, how to send us messages that misguide us and send us down rabbit holes or dark paths that produce nothing. And it's our responsibility to support the minds and the soldiers and the, and the thinkers that will come up with the solutions that will allow us to step out of this. Now, I said this, what, 30 years ago, and I'm still sitting here, but I'm going to say it again when it even has more meaning uh, now than it did then. I, I said 30 years ago that we will not see true black liberation, true black empowerment, true black advancement, true black generational wealth until we have enough black men who are willing to plant seeds that we will not live long enough to see come to fruition. And and, and, and people will, what does that mean? That means that we've got to stop looking for the pat on the back, the quick fix, the band-aid. We are going to have to start uh, sitting up and saying, I'm going to pour into a generation of four, five, six, seven, and eight and ten year olds with a rite of passage or a socialization program for both black boys and black girls that introduces to, to themselves but not just in a, 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 a short period or short frame but introduces them to who they are now and what they will become and what they are capable of being in a level that it anchors them and we are going to have to insulate them and what does that mean it means that those peak those those four-year-olds and five-year-olds may be 40 before they come into their few their full maturity I may not be here in 40 years I hope I'm hoping I am, but I may not be, but I have to be willing to invest in the future because while I may not be here, my children will and and their children. And then even after they are gone, their children are going to reap the seeds that I've I, they're going to harvest the seeds and reap the seeds of what I've planted and what I've given as an individual, as a patriarch, as a community uh, uh, soldier and warrior and in and, and mind, I am saying, I am laying the foundation. And so w what I said then, I'm saying again now, if we don't uh, have enough of us who are willing to plant seeds into a generation that we can protect, build and insulate, um, and these seeds may not come to fruition until we are gone. If we are not willing to do that, we have no chance. There's no quick fix. There's no quick undoing. There's no thread to pull and everything unravels and all things come together. We're going to have to put in some work. So yes, I'm challenging you because I have consistently put in the work. I have consistently sent you the same message. I have consistently brought forth book after book, article after article, research paper published after research paper, program after program, and I see the fruits of my labor. That's what keeps me going. I see it works, but it's working on such a small scale that it's not impacting. You know, imagine I'm impacting maybe a thousand or two a year maybe two or three thousand a year i'm talking about directly seriously engaging and touching now a lot of people watch my stuff and the people who read my stuff but i'm talking about really touching there are 48 million of us in this country the vast majority of that 48 million are in some way significantly impacted by the mechanisms and machinations of systemic racism and discrimination in this country. The vast majority are in some way uh, suffering from some form of generational trauma, uh, some mental illness or mental psychosis and interruption of their natural social state. And we are just dabbling in the surface of doing something about it when we have the means we have the uh the work we have the data we have the the scales and the principles i mean and i'm uh, uh, i'm i'm alongside some pretty broad shoulders and brilliant minds with doc, dr naeem agbar dr joy degru 
uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the late Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, the late Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, um, uh, uh, Chancellor Williams, uh, and I can go on and on of minds who put what they earned, what they learned and understood documented it and published it and put it out there for others like myself to come along and scoop up and then advance it. That's the whole thing. It's not about laying your stake in your claim and trying to be the, the, this, the, that. It's about saying they gave me this. How far, how much further can I advance it? How much further can I take it? How much more can I learn about it? What can I teach? What can I use? What can I pass on to the next mind willing to take on the baton of putting their life into this work? And then we are hoping that in doing this, we expand the understanding that we do it. The problem is we have a talented tenth that's disconnected. We have a talented tenth that's um, satisfied with um, being recognized and quasi accepted by uh, the system and the status quo. Uh, we fit in, so we, we are good. We know how to work the system. We gonna get ours. And we don't realize that the talented 10th isn't meant to stand out and above the 90. It's meant to inform, empower, and lead the 90. That's why you never hear me agreeing with the conversation we need to leave them behind. Because my brother Malcolm said that we've got to be very careful as we learn, as we discover, as we become, how we judge those who are not where we are. Because once we were there, once we didn't know, once we were unawakened. And so I am very careful. My job isn't to get out and then go do what I do. Yes, I can I could live a very, very, very sweet and nice life. I proved that in the first half of my life. That's what, what it was about for me. Until I just woke up every freaking morning, three o'clock in the morning, empty. I mean, to have everything you've ever set up and said you wanted plus and be miserable is depressing. Trust me. Because everything you thought you was going to make you happy, you got it. And you're still not happy. You're still not fulfilled. But see, I had someone that was willing to call me on it. Say, hey, you can get all this stuff. You can accumulate it all. You can put as many cars in that driveway as you want to. You can add more square footage onto the house. You can add a couple more zeros to the bank account. And you still are going to feel the way you feel because you're not living in your purpose. And I tell people all the time that the first half of my life was about me, but the second half of my life is about my legacy. And that's what I'm doing. So when people ask, why should I give? We've got to do something beyond talk. We've got to do something beyond complain. We've got to do something beyond whine. If we're ever going to truly lay a foundation. My, my thing is, I love my family enough. I love my people. I love black people. I just love them. Uh, every aspect, every, I don't care where they at in their, in their life's journey. I don't care how, uh, ghetto, how hood, how thug, how ratchet. I don't care how snooty and bougie. I love my people. But what I'll tell you is I want more for my people. I want my people to truly embrace the power within and to grow into something remarkable, ex uh, extraordinary, phenomenal, because we're built for it, but we've been convinced and we are being fed a narrative that we are taking hook, line, and sinker, and it is literally destroying the future of our progeny. And so when I say, I love my family, I, I, I'm not just doing this for me and those of us that are, I'm doing it for the, 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 the uh, seeds of my loins that I'll never ever meet. I'm creating a legacy, but I'm also laying a foundation for a better life for them. And it should be universal. It shouldn't just be selective. It just shouldn't be just those who got a feeling of or understanding now doing what they're doing. We And then we got a bunch that know and hide it because they want to feel special. So they don't even share it with anybody. They got it and they want to feel like they're special. So they, they would rather have those behind them look up to them 
than to walk with them and say, I'm different. I, I don't need anybody looking up to me. But if those if there are those who are looking up, I hope they're looking up, looking to rise, to come with me, not to praise, not to adore, not to, you know, thank you for the thank yous. Thank you for the appreciation, but come walk with me. Come stand with me. Come rub shoulders with me. Come check out the view. Uh, of where I'm standing and where, where I'm observing for so that then we can raise the bar and we all climb even higher. That's what I'm striving for. So that's why you should give. Epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics is the study of the influence of environment on gene performance. Uh, simple explanation. In other words, um, environments of stress have the ability to upregulate or downregulate gene performance. Now, let me give you a quick analogy so we can kind of move into this quickly. You have both disease genes, cancer genes are present. Uh, they are part of your DNA genetic makeup. Uh, but you also have immune genes, genes that are designed to fight off diseases. And when there is uh, some type of encroachment or the awakening to shut down disease genes, and when there is even an injury, say, for instance, a disease does start to be able to heal. So when you look at epigenetics, epigenetics is the explanation of how we are actually able to heal ourselves without synthetic medications or um, highly invasive procedures. Uh, unfortunately, as with everything in the world, there are extremes on one spectrum. Fear and courage, wealth and poverty, sickness health and so where epigenetics has the ability to create uh, and upregulate immune genes that work to make sure the body is healthy it can also downregulate disease genes and upregulate disease genes and in in for specific cancers so, so to speak certain a certain number of genes have to be upregulated upreg simultaneously while other genes are turned off for cancers to develop and, and, and thrive. And that's done in, an, in, in a stressful environment. The most prevalent influence on disease is stress. Not what you eat. That's important, though, uh, because that also breaks down uh, the... Uh, immune system and attack cells and genes uh, but here's the other reason why what you eat is important in this it's not just what's in the food that's going to directly contribute to celeste cancer let's stick with the theme of cancer not just the thing that will contribute to it like sugar is a major influence but not just that but what does food do that we often don't even think about? It impacts our moods. Certain things you eat will make you feel certain ways. Sugar impacts your mood. Caffeine impacts your mood. Uh, all of these stimulants and hormones and things that are in uh, these, these, these foods that we eat, especially from live animals, uh, are products, uh, products from live animals, have hormones in them. We, already, we automatically know from studies that hormones impact our mood. Sarah, you know, serotonin, uh, dopamine, all these different things, these chemicals that the brain has the ability to secrete create certain moods. Well, when you eat certain food, that impacts that, right? Well, if you're impacting your mood in a negative way, that makes you view things in a certain way. You what? Raise your stress level. Raise your stress level. What do you do? You upregulate genes that are detrimental. Now, that's just one element and component of uh, epigenetics. Another real important thing is where I really actually stumbled into it is I was studying the uh, survivors from the Jewish, ho Jewish Holocaust and came across some uh, very uh, compelling uh, scientific data and studies on those who were survivors. Uh, and there was a couple of reports uh, that talked about some phenomenon where grandchildren of survivors, children who were not born, or even conceived during the time of the Holocaust, 
had not been briefed on the specifics of their grandparents' experience. You know, they told we we had to fight and we had to survive and we went through this and they did this to us. But I'm talking about these kids were having dreams of things their grandparents actually went through. And it was crazy. But what 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 the Jews did, and this is important that we understand this, they invested in the research to understand the phenomenon because they understood that something like that could have a negative impact. They understood enough to know if you're carrying the dreams of my trauma, are you carrying my trauma? And so they did the research and what they found is whenever you experience a traumatic experience, the gene, the, the body experiences trauma uh, first, and this is what people really don't understand trauma, the body experiences trauma uh, first. You literally experience trauma physiologically, and then it, it translates as the brain catches up to the psychological and emotional experience of the trauma. So the actual trauma is anchored in the cells of the body. Every cell records the memory of the trauma. That's why uh, a smell can trigger a person. Somebody brushing up against you in a certain way if you've had certain type of trauma, a certain sound, all of these different things are triggering the body and the body is the first thing that you feel it in right that you start to get that feeling the hair starts to stand up on your on your neck uh you get antsy uh, nervous and agitated uh you have a natural physiological hypervigilance that every little thing sets you off your it's because the body has been traumatized it's carrying the trauma in every cell so what happens is when that happens is there's this thing called an epigenetic tag. It's an imprint on the DNA, on the gene. Now, it doesn't change uh, DNA sequence. Now, there are some studies starting to say that, hey, maybe even DNA sequence can be altered by an extreme situation, an extreme uh, event. And that's still in the early stages, things that we thought were unchangeable. We're learning all the time is used to be a belief that once you reach seven, eight years old, your personality is hardwired. If you're an introvert, you're an introvert for life. If you're an extrovert, you're an extrovert for life. If you are, uh, in, uh, you know, mean, you're going to always be mean. Uh, and what we find out, there's this thing called neuroplasticity that we literally, by what we engage mentally and emotionally, uh, on a regular basis are creating what we call neuro uh, synaptic connections of new ideas and thoughts. And the more you entertain the new idea and thought, the more stronger the new idea becomes. And simultaneously, the old idea, because it is not being fed by attention, starts to atrophy and eventually disappears. And now you have a new frame of thought, a new way of thinking. This is how we change our approach. This is how you change somebody from being a a consumer to an investor. This is how you change somebody from being an addict to sober, uh, a, a true healing, not just simply a practice in behavior. Now, you, you want to merge both behavior and cognitive reality, but you also must understand that this is happening on a uh, ge genetic cellular level, a cellular or genetic level. And so what I learned is these epigenetic tags are genuine, you know, usually in, in, in mild cases, they are through the process of meiosis, which is the reproductive process, the cellular reproductive process of the uh, reproductive system. Now, you have regular uh, cellular reproduction, which is uh, mitosis, where every, every, say, 90 days or so, uh, the body, uh, each cell in the body sits up and reproduces two new cells identical to itself and then it destroys itself and those two new cells replace it and this is done over and over again this is how mutations happen uh but anyway so that's mitosis but meiosis the cellular reproduction goes through a different process and one of the processes especially within the female is where the female um process is literally designed to remove tags it's nature's way or god's way of creating what nature's way is to remove uh those experiences so they aren't passed down to the next generation the problem is traumatic experiences can be so emphatic that even going through meiosis that tag is still passed and, and it's passed when you sit up and you bring 
23 chromosomes from the male, 23 chromosomes from the female to create the 46 chromosomes that becomes the new ovum, uh, eventually the fetus, eventually uh, a newborn child. So then what happens in that? is that tag is with that kid. That kid has brought forth with them certain behaviors and instinctive responses to certain types of stimuli based off of a traumatic experience from one of the parents. And that is one of the ways that uh, multi-generational transmission of trauma is passed down. So then what, 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 what must we do? We must create an environment that over time minimizes the impact of that so that that uh, genetic tag, that epigenetic tag, first of all, isn't passed on to another generation, but also doesn't have a long-term consistent impact on the life of that child. That trauma so then how do we do that environment we create an ideal environment what but here's the problem normally somebody going through an experience where it's traumatic and they don't get treated normally live a life that is less than uh, that is filled with some form of drama some form of uh, frustration some form of pressure and stress because they haven't dealt with the trauma so then the chance of them having a child in the ideal environment isn't good and that's where you come up with adverse childhood experiences which is what this particular topic of epigenetics was on this um uh, this um workshop i did with the harris county uh sheriff's office and wellspring and you know i mean if you go through it lists 10 adverse childhood experiences that literally impact children um and literally have long reaching uh health outcomes throughout life in other words uh when you have an adverse childhood experience meaning some form of a traumatic experience in childhood then it impacts your health not just your behavior not just your psychology not just your emotional well-being but your overall physiological health and well-being over the course of your life um, the top 10 and most recognized adverse childhood experiences is physical abuse verbal abuse sexual abuse physical neglect emotional neglect alcoholic parent or a parent that is in some way addicted to a controlled substance but specifically alcoholic parents has a different mechanism in that and a whole bunch of things uh an incarcerated family member disappearing of a parent through divorce death or abandonment a family member diagnosed with a mental illness a mother is a victim of domestic violence and now just imagine out of those 10 how many can say you have at least one now imagine how many have four and you may be asking why is four so important because when you get to four you start talking about major shifts in overall life outcomes in health uh we're talking about a child with four um uh four aces each one of those is considered an ace every uh form of abuse is an ace in and of itself uh so then you have four aces you are 12 times more likely to attempt suicide over the, at some point in your life, you are four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in America. Uh, we're wondering why there's such a, uh, you are four times to six times more likely to develop certain forms of cancer. Um, you are three and a half times more likely to develop type two diabetes, experience uh, kidney failure, uh, develop lupus, and, and on down the line and these are directly associated with these and they have been studied uh the cdc and kaiser did the initial uh study on adverse childhood experiences in the 90s and then we have followed up with several more since then and we understand that there's a direct link to the number of aces you experience and the impact it has on you not just in your mental health and your performance but also 
in that now you are also what four to six times more likely to experience depression now when you consider the fact that black women are already the most prevalent uh population in depression black men are the least likely to seek help for depression and that there is a 49 percent spike in suicides among young black males between the ages of 14 and 24 over the last six years you can understand why we really need to have a handle on this See, it started out with me just wanting to address the argument that was being made in the 90s that it's been over 100 years, black folks get over it. That it's been 100 years. How long are we going to hear the word slavery? There's no such thing as multi-generational trauma. And so my, 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 my desire was to say, okay, first of all, as a, a person who bases their truths in observable in observable uh, realities and situations uh, via the scientific method, I don't just automatically assume I'm right. Uh, when someone creates a challenge to a position I hold, then I must address the challenge. I can't simply dismiss it because it hasn't been a part of my idea of my thinking. I have to say, well, what if that person is right? What if I haven't considered that particular mechanism or that particular truth or that particular influence? So now I need to go back and look. So rather than just sit up and consistently argue and push the idea of generational trauma, I had to go back in and say, okay, I know that there's this been done, this, but let's talk and let's look at it differently. Let's look and see just how influential and impactful slavery was first. And then, as I told you yesterday, one of the things that we understand when we start talking about trauma is with blacks is that it's hard, it, it, it's hard to say it's been 150 plus years. Uh, what is it, 158 years now? It's hard to say that it's been 150, going on 158 years um since slavery get over it right it's hard to say that when our nightmare in this country didn't end in 1865 and in many instances it intensified yes we were free we were freed from plantations but because we were no longer chattel we had no value there was no reason to keep us alive because we had no value. See, you, 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 slaves were rarely killed for no reason at all because they had a value. They had no value dead. Slaves were killed um, to make points to other slaves uh, because they couldn't be controlled uh, and they were a threat to the order on the plantation. Um, but other than that, beaten, punished, terrorized and tortured, yes, killed, no, until we were set free. So we went from being captives to being targets. Wherein are we supposed to heal? We went into 12 years of reconstruction in which they literally rebuilt the antebellum south and reestablished white supremacy and a right pick and, 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 and a privileged pecking order for the elite. We moved out of reconstruction where everything pretty much went back to normal and slavery just continued by another name. Um, and we went into black codes. The black code said you can't own property black man. The black code said you can't hold this job or, or start a company doing this, black man. Again, perpetuating the poverty of the slave that was inherited at the time of their release. Then they brought in sharecropping as a, a, a subtle form of slavery. We're going to give you some land. You're going to give you the tools and the seeds and everything to work the land. And you're going to have to pay us back for working the land, but whatever you make over that is yours. But they made sure that they put enough of a debt burden on you that you never broke even. And seeing, be, growing up and being reared in the home with my great grandfather born in 1909, the son of a sharecropper, 
I know the stories well. I understand it. he had to drop out of school and seven years old to go out in the field to help his dad to get things done at a rate uh, that they could actually turn enough of a profit, profit to keep a roof, roof over their heads. That was the subtle form of slavery. Then there came convict leasing. Convict leasing is where they decided to criminalize the black experience. We, we aren't going to let you own land. We're not going to allow you to take most jobs. We aren't going to allow you to start your own business. Uh, and then we're going to make it illegal for you not to be on it, for you to be unemployed and, and not have a place to live. Then we're going to lock you up. We're going to make it a felony. We're going to lock you up uh, as long as 12 to 15 years. People were locked up for 12 and 15 years for simply being homeless and not having a place to live in a place in a space where they weren't allowed to take jobs. You see this thing, how it works. And uh, so, again, where is this healing supposed to take place? Then they would go in and be arrested and, and, and put in prison and then leased back out to the plantations that they had been freed from. Leased to railroad companies to lay railroad track and work railroads. Leased to construction companies to build buildings and schools and prisons. Where were we supposed to heal? And I can go on and down the line with redlining, gentrification, uh, urban renewal, benign neglect, mass incarceration, miseducation, gentrification, all these different things. I, I can go on down the line. Tell me when it stopped. They're murdering us in the street in 2023. Tell me when it stopped. There's a disproportionality in uh, special, edu special education referrals for black males. They are giving our young black boys psychotropic drugs for diagnoses such as uh, ADHD and uh, oppositional defiant disorder. These psychotropic drugs like Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta, Adderall, and on are Schedule II drugs, highly addictive and mind-altering with very little medical purpose for the purpose of making them docile and sit still when that's not even how kids that age learn. But we're supposed to heal. Now you gotta keep in mind that this little boy is probably a little hyperactive because he's coming from a stressed out environment at home where he has already accumulated four or five aces. He's in a stressful environment that he's probably in the home where at least one of his parents has four or five aces and has experienced trauma. The statistics simply speak to it. So he's now at school being asked to be still and sit back and be quiet. And nobody's asking about the culture at home. Nobody's asking about the culture in the community. Nobody is sitting up and saying something has to change. Epigenetics tells us that the stress that we've experienced alone associated with our blackness, the microaggressive, the stress associated with microaggressions, you know what I'm talking about, the microaggressions where they talk condescending to you and they make the assumption because you're black you're stupid, it makes you feel some kind of way. That, that that thing you feel is actually a level of stress. They're stressing you. you just, the way they talk to you at work. But you got to go to work because you got to get paid. You're stressed. The way you feel black man and some black women, but definitely black man, when a police officer gets behind you, they haven't even lit you up. They're just behind you. That's a microaggression that's a level of stress. That's a consistent reality for the average black person. Uh, oh, we can go on and on and look at the real true uh, statistics that although white males under the age of 30 are three times more likely to have illicit drugs on them, black men are five to six times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs. 
while black men make up 6% of this country's population, we make up 40% of the prison population. And the narrative is being constantly perpetuated that we are naturally criminal minded. We are inherently violent. And no one's looking at the, the studies and the numbers as far as criminality and uh, criminology and penology goes. It doesn't matter what color you are. You put a person in an impoverished environment where there's lack and the crime rate goes up. And where the crime rate goes up, violence goes up, has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with socioeconomic realities. And where are we supposed to be healing? When are we supposed to have enough time that we can deal with the infractions and infringements and encroachments of yesterday when today is equally as bad? And as I studied this and I looked and, and everybody's talking about, well, the Jews went through this and look at what they are doing. Well, number one is they had 12 years of some pretty horrible stuff that happened to them, 12 years of oppression. But here's the thing. Number one, I, here's what I give to them. They saw that there was a need to understand what they went through and to do something about it. So they invested in research. And then they follow the guidance of the researchers in how to deal with it. But here's the other thing. They immediately decided that they weren't victims. They decided that they were survivors. So just the idea of saying I'm a survivor dictates how you respond to trauma. When I have a traumatic experience, if I decide that I am a survivor, it immediately tells me I had some form of participation in my survival in that I came out of it. And there is in that behavior power. But if I take on the mindset that I'm a victim, that I've been had, that I've been mistreated, that they've done this and I need them to stop, I'm going to beg them, I'm going to plead with them, I'm going to present to them all the facts and ask them to stop. I'm saying I'm helpless. And the more helpless you are when you experience trauma, the more emphatic the traumatic experience. We, we, we did studies. We wanted to know how is it that certain people can go through the same thing and have different experiences and levels of trauma. Uh, prime example, there were people who were in those buildings in 9-11 that are thriving, that are doing unbelievable things in their lives, may have went to the company that they worked for, may have requested that they see a therapist or something for a certain amount of time, and they may have went or may not have went, but they're thriving, and they were in that mess. They were literally there. And then you got some people who saw it on television in an entirely different country that I know for a fact because I do the research, still getting treatment. How do we determine the difference? How a person sees themselves in it. One of the most helpless things that can happen is to be watching somebody go through something. There's nothing you can do about it. That's why I tell you, stay away from trauma porn. Stay away from something where you know something is about to happen in the video. Everything says this, this is going to happen and you're going to watch it. You can't control what happens. It The inability to be able to control the outcome makes you helpless and you still saw that. Now you can't unsee it and it's tearing at you. And it may not be a fully traumatic experience to the point where it traumatizes you, but it weakens your threshold. The more you experience these microaggressions, the less likely you are going to be able to withstand a major hit. Just imagine this is your threshold. Anything beneath this means you are now traumatized. And imagine a good, healthy person is up here. And imagine that, you know, somebody calls and says your cousin so-and-so died. You come here. You get fired. You come here. And you go through, and, and all of a sudden you're here. Well, the chances are they call you and say, Mom, just pass. Or you get into a major car wreck. Or you happen to be in a mass shooting, you're going to end up here, right? So then you've got to be able to sit up and manage that. You've got to be able to sit up and say, this is how we have to manage that. But the thing is, in this progressive thing towards this threshold, you have the ability to say, I'm not going to be a victim. The moment you say, I'm not going to be a victim, it reduces the impact of the trauma. Because it says, I fought. I came out. Of, watch. Tina Turner. Prime example. This is not about all the social things and what's going on in the discussions about 
what's going on with who she married and all that. Y'all know how I feel. I'm not getting into that. Uh, God rest her soul. I want to talk about what she did and how she did it and what makes her strong. Because everybody loves to apply this title to strong to every freaking thing. But I'm going to tell you what makes her strong. She went through trauma. And it tore her down. It broke her down. I mean, to go through 17, 18 years of what she went through, she was broken. She didn't know she, her, 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 her self-esteem, her self-worth, all these things were under attack. He knew exactly how to do it. He did it. But at some point, she discovered something about herself. She discovered or she just got sick and tired. A bit. Whatever it was, it was a point where she, she sort of said, this is it. This is the last time. And she walked away. But I'm going to tell you where... She took her power. And I don't know if she knew that's what she was doing, but this is what she did. It may have just been, I don't want to have Jack to do with this dude. I don't want it to be said he gave me Jack. I'm going to, whatever. But whatever, she, this is what she took her power when she sat up and said, look, I don't want anything. I'm giving you the royalties, the rights to the music, everything. I'm just going to walk out of here and I'm going to start my life over. I'm going to keep my moniker, Tina Turner. I've earned it. And I'm going to start over. She started her new life, her new career after 40 and became known as the queen of rock and roll, completely flipped and reinvented herself and was able to walk out of that. And obviously she still brought some things with her because there are things we understand. And, it, you know, you don't go through life and you become perfect, but you can become strong. And she came out of it and she created this entire new life, built, rebuilt from scratch and became better than the original as far as the impact she had on the world, in the world of music. That's because she decided she wasn't going to be a victim. She decided she was going to be a victor. She was going to take control of her life. And that's the important thing. And these are the things that we can literally teach and control. We can't control everything, but we can control how we respond to it. We have to get away from a victim mentality. And in order to get away from a victim mentality, we have to assume a role of power and strength in our communities. And that's a place that we're really, truly failing. So I, like I said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to touch on this some more. But um, this thing, man. Look at this. More than 2.7 million children in the U.S. has an incarcerated parent and approximately 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives. Texas is at home to an estimated 400,000 children with a parent serving time in prison. That's just one ace. But that's a powerful one. Because, see, now you're talking about aces, but you also have to think about influence. How many times have we talked about studies of absent fathers, absent parents, what happens in a single-parent household? All of these things are infringements and infractions and have negative experiences and impacts on our trauma experience in this country. Yes, everybody deals with divorce regardless of race. Everybody deals with incarceration regardless of race, but we are definitely the most emphatically impacted by it. 6%, we make up 6% of the population but 40% of the prison population. The truth is, we're no more criminal-minded than they are. Actually, they are naturally more criminal-minded deceitful. And they will lose their mind hearing me saying that, but they are. Because they're in a situation where they don't have to and they still do. We tend to operate from a place of desperation, which is, a, which is another form of trauma. These, and we literally have adapted, not adapted, we have adopted the idea that a lot of what we experience in our communities, a lot of what we go through, a lot of the behaviors are cultural. No, they're not culture. They're the outpouring of a traumatic experience that has yet to be stifled and we need to start dealing with that so that's where i'm going to cut it off today i'm going to shut down i hope that i was able to bring home some things i'm i'm glad i finally able got i was able to do it without doing a quick one on the run going somewhere i actually took time and was able to sit down and talk this one out um 
so that's that again i'm going to impress upon you the importance of supporting the work uh that we do at the odyssey project it is integral uh to the growth and empowerment of our people the uh empowerment and preparation of our youth and so much more we are going to have to be strategic in our movement emotional charged rallies are not going to get it done that amounts to a collective temper tantrum with no power behind it we are going to have to be strategic we're going to have to be calculative we're going to have to be engaged and so i'm challenging you to support the work we do look in the description box and uh determine which way you want to get there a couple of different ways you can do it and give whether it's cash app whether it's directly on our site whether it's through donor box or whatever but whatever you do support our work on that note i'm checking out of here i want to thank you again you guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.